When the American colonies revolted in 1776, the world recognized the rising tide of freedom. Its intoxicating spirit traveled around the globe, inspiring similar revolutions, especially in France, where popular uprisings demanded the end of aristocratic rule. And so, when the fragile American Union exploded into civil war in 1861, the world held its breath. Over a four-year period, the American landscape was bathed in blood as over half a million men were slaughtered on the fields of battle. More than four times the U.S. casualties in the Vietnam and Korean Wars combined. Could a government of the people survive this brutal conflict which included the murder of its most beloved leader? That America survived this historic crucible became an inspiration around the world and was felt most keenly in France, where artists and intellectuals admired the American fortitude. It was during an 1865 dinner party in the Paris home of Professor Edouard de La Boulay that the idea was first suggested create a monument to honor America on its 100th anniversary as the Cradle of Liberty. It would be designed by one of the dinner guests, Frédéric Auguste Bartholdi, to express the admiration of the French people. At the same time, it would serve as a public slap in the face to Napoleon III, the reigning French monarch who had no taste for the intellectual liberty of his own countrymen. Bartholdi was an old hand at creating such monuments, the arc of his career suggested that this female representation of liberty would be a triumphant crescendo. As an artist, he reflected the unique sensibilities of his age. The period in which she was created, uh, and the second half of the last century, was an enormously gigantic period of bravado and symbolism uh, in the architecture of cities, in literature, in art. It was a period of, of great bursting out. Bartholdi's early sketches captured the work's ultimate attitude and pose but it was the image of his mother's stern face which supplied the enigmatic expression. The, f the enigmatic expression. The final work would be called the Statue of Liberty Enlightening the World, and its size would mirror the mammoth proportions of the New World itself. It would stretch over 305 feet high. The figure would be composed of 450,000 pounds of hammered copper plates, enough metal to press 30 million pennies. The nose would be four and a half feet long, each eye two and a half feet wide, the face more than 17 feet from chin to brow. Over 300 metal plates were needed to complete the figure, designed to interlock in an artistic technique called repose. Monsieur Serge Pascal is one of the few remaining artisans who still perform the technique. The sculptor is going to work with a mass. He's going to create his work from a block of stone. Whereas we give a flat sheet a definite shape that looks like something. It was his company that recently worked with American crews to restore the statue. It begins by using a plumb bob pointing system to form giant plaster replicas of the model design. Then a wooden frame, a negative form, is built around the plaster. Into this frame, the copper sheets are formed. In the repoussage technique, we start out with a flat sheet of metal. It has to be shaped. It has to be what we call round embossing. We had to introduce heat up to like 400 degrees Fahrenheit to be able to get that the forms to bend uh, properly. Hundreds of different types of hammers, because each hammer had a certain amount of bounce to it, a certain amount of uh, pressure that it could perform, a certain amount of pebbling effect that it would perform. We have inherited, if you will, this technique from our parents, who with others helped make the Statue of Liberty in France. 
It's both a tradition in the family as well as in the trade. Because the final structure is hollow, keeping the statue's shell stable is an equally difficult engineering task. Up to this time, the statues of this size were all solid. And that was the original concept for this. The original architect engineer that was working with Bartholdi was Violet Leduc. And he had a plan for filling the interior with boxes of sand to give it stability so the wind wouldn't tip it over and so forth. In a divine act of providence, Leduc suddenly died. And so did the notion of stuffing the statue with sand. Instead, Gustav Eiffel, the engineering genius of the Eiffel Tower fame, proposed a radical new concept. His concept, which is entirely new, was to build a tower, a, an iron tower, and then frame out from it and support the copper uh, statue, which was very much like a dressmaker's dummy. The result was a monument which inside and out captured the imagination. Its structural support was as radical as the new social structures defining the American ideal. Eiffel had mentioned that it was a magnificent space, a cathedral kind of space inside. Bartholdi himself chose the site for his statue in America, a small patch of land in New York Harbor called Bedlow Island. It was an overgrown oyster bed named after an early Dutch settler who purchased the property from the Mohican tribal nation. The United States had built a fort on the island in 1800 and it served as the site for a military hospital, communication center, and ammo dump during the Civil War. Bartholdi's vision to erect the statue here was a bold move and a logistical challenge which would demand substantial funding. So in 1874, he formed the Union Franco-American Committee to raise the funds through public lotteries. He had already decided to begin work on the copper reposé before the money had actually been donated, hoping that there would be sufficient contributions to finish. Bartholdi's Paris workshop was big and loud and packed with an army of exacting artisans. Even ex-president Ulysses S. Grant dropped by to watch the progress but the work was slow and underfunded. By 1876, the year the statue was to be completed, only the right arm and torch were in shape for a presentation. They were sent to Philadelphia as part of the American Centennial Exposition. The hope was to build interest and generate contributions towards the completion of the gift. By this time, Bartoli had decided that France would supply the statue and America should construct the pedestal even though the United States had yet to accept the colossal gift and Bartoli hadn't acquired the rights to use Bedloe's Island. What a weird idea to, to uh, give a huge statue. And uh, there was a, a lot of, of pulling and pushing, saying, no, we don't want it. And finally, the, the, the uh, US ambassador had convinced uh, the Congress to say, no, you must take it because the French are going to be upset. Many people were suspicious of the French gift celebrating the American Revolution. Would the sculpture portray liberty as a bare-breasted revolutionary as rendered in European art? The New York Times suggested that the statue was a scam for Bartoli to make a personal fortune. And American millionaires like J.P. Morgan and Cornelius Vanderbilt joined Grover Cleveland in declaring that the promotion of liberty would cause unrest among America's lower class, the working poor. But with the enthusiastic support of newspaper publisher Joseph Pulitzer, the American Committee was formed in 1877 to organize grassroots funding after the government, the wealthy, and their corporations turned their backs. Well, every trick was used 100 years ago to try to raise money from, uh, from selling toothpaste, which was the Statue of Liberty toothpaste, to uh, selling small replica. Even before she was fully assembled, the Statue of Liberty became a celebrity spokesperson for all manner of products in order to raise construction funds. She has been an advertising icon ever since.
The product endorsement feeding frenzy took the new art of hucksterism to dizzying heights, but it wasn't enough. Pulitzer realized that the project had to tap into America's soul, and he persuaded a young poetess, Emma Lazarus, to compose a stirring verse to capture the public's imagination. The poem was called The New Colossus. It was inspired by the tragic slaughter of Russian Jews during the pogroms of the era. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, she wrote. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, the tempest-tossed, to me. Meanwhile, liberty was erected on the streets of Paris, an exile herself, waiting for the money and the permission to emigrate to the United States. Though many French citizens were determined that she not be given to a seemingly ungrateful America, the finished statue was presented to U.S. Ambassador Levi P. Morton on July 4, 1884. One month later in the United States, work began on construction of the statue's gigantic pedestal, a 154-foot-high behemoth, nearly as tall as the statue itself. The foundation would be recessed 53 feet into the earth to support the massive weight and spread over more than 8,000 square feet at the base. It was the largest placement of concrete, mass concrete, that had been done up to that time. And it was still in a state of uh, uh, development. The cornerstone was a six-ton slab of Connecticut granite set in place on a rainy afternoon ceremony on August 5, 1884. Yet the celebration was short-lived. Less than three weeks later, the project had exhausted its funds and work stopped. So, so the statue was accepted, was built and ready to be shipped, and there was still no pedestal because there was no money to, to really pay for this, uh, for this pedestal. Once again, Joseph Pulitzer attacked what he called the American disgrace by rallying the support of the American people, offering children, the poor and the humble, an opportunity to donate their pennies and nickels to the effort and in exchange see their names printed on the front page of his newspaper. The effort was a resounding success, raising $102,000 and helping the Liberty design become stylish and fashionable. Cornelius Vanderbilt's daughter even dressed as Liberty for a festive social affair. The party cost more than the building of the statue itself and her upper crust party guests refused to contribute to the celebration of the common man. June 17, 1885, the Statue of Liberty arrived in New York Harbor. More than 300 pieces distributed in 214 numbered crates. It would take over four weeks before the crates were even unloaded. But there was no hurry. Construction of the pedestal had yet to be completed. For 10 months, Liberty's assorted body parts littered Bedloe's Island until the work of bonding the enormous copper plates to the iron armature could begin. A spiraling staircase was attached to the center structural beam which allowed workmen access to the elevated points at which pieces would be secured to the frame. Though now closed, this same staircase was once used by visitors to climb to the top of the monument through the hollow cathedral of Liberty's form. The giant jigsaw puzzle didn't always fit as planned. Liberty's crown, seven rays of light, representing the seven continents, was positioned too close to her right arm, allowing a dagger-like ray of light to actually pierce her copper flesh. That was what we referred to as a birth defect. That occurred while it was being constructed. It was the artist himself who was responsible for the flaw back at the studio in Paris. Bartholdi, the sculptor, uh, asked for a modification, which is after all the least that a sculptor doing a work of this size would be expected to, to ask. The modification was to raise Liberty's arm and torch a few degrees higher than the original design. But this change compromised the statue's structural strength. Because it was moved, it became much less stiff, much less strong, and took a lot of ingenuity to make it work. 
The defect often blamed on the American workers who assembled the statue remained uncorrected for the next 100 years. Finally, on October 28, 1886, the Statue of Liberty was complete. Ten years and 116 days after the original American centennial delivery date. After 21 years of planning, fundraising and sculpting, Liberty stood tall. Across a fog-shrouded harbor, nearly a million people struggled to view the unveiling ceremonies. Liberty appeared as a silhouette through the mist. A tricolored French flag covered her face. President Grover Cleveland, who once opposed the statue, welcomed a crowd of dignitaries on the island. Ironically, American women were not allowed to participate in the festivities honoring a feminine representation of liberty. We cannot guarantee their safety among a crowd of men, officials claimed. Enraged members of the New York State Women's Suffragette Association chartered a boat and stormed the ceremony anyway, chanting their displeasure through megaphones to disrupt the proceedings. The pandemonium they triggered cut short the long-winded speeches when Liberty's veil was dropped prematurely. The following day, professional orator Chauncey Depew recreated his aborted speech for posterity on a new technological miracle a clay cylinder recording device. Here is his actual voice, captured over a century ago. At long last, Liberty had made her home in America looking out to sea and beckoning many more immigrants towards the golden door of the new world. And with their arrival, the nation's attention would shift to another small island in the harbor, Ellis Island. Cabrera, Behoud, Einstein, Garibaldi, McCormick, Nielsen. Former second line. My name is Hermann Müller. I come from Hamburg in Deutschland. 40% of the American population can trace somebody back in his family through Ellis Island. And I really think that that's what America is all about. In 1890, New York City was digging the subway system. So they were able to take the landfill from the subways, bring it out to Ellis Island. So Ellis grew from three and a half acres in size to 27 and a half acres. Like Liberty Island, where the statue stands, Ellis Island was a forgotten patch of land. This mass immigration that was coming was, was very financially beneficial to the steamship companies. They would go over, say, to a small village in Italy and put up posters of a cornucopia. And the immigrants literally believed that there was gold everywhere. In 1920, my father aged about 33 and my mother was about 30. And my sister, who was five months old, and myself embarked for America. The gold in the Medina, the land where the streets were paved with gold. We sailed out of Genoa uh, in the month of January, uh, 1920, and the ship was always stopping on the way to pick up coal, and it took us 30 days to get here. The ship was crowded. It wasn't clean. We were frightened. The smell of bodies all over the place. It was difficult living aboard. And we were hungry. 
We were so hungry that I remember vividly that my father and I went up to the first deck and found the garbage cans on that deck. And the garbage cans, we dug down and brought up food. And we brought it down for my mother, and my mother would never eat it. The steamships would pull into Manhattan and two medical inspectors from Ellis Island would board the steamships and go to the cabin class people and the first class people and give them a very quick medical examination aboard the steamship. They felt that if these people could afford the $65 for an expensive ticket, they could obviously support themselves. The people that traveled to Ellis are those that traveled in steerage while the rich were invited to walk right down the gangplank into Manhattan. The poor were not allowed off the boat. And traveling below deck in steerage, they never saw the Statue of Liberty welcoming them to America. Instead, they were herded onto crowded ferries and shipped to the imposing brick and tile processing center on Ellis Island, a collection of bureaucratic buildings where their American experience would begin. They would enter Ellis Island to the baggage room. They would have the opportunity to check their bags so they wouldn't have to carry them while they were being processed. Well, if you were a Russian Jew escaping the pogroms in Russia, a man in uniform would be very frightening to you. If they were all the possessions you owned in the world, you wouldn't want to give them up. But there was actually an even more important reason why the immigrants held on to their baggage. They knew that they were about to undergo a medical examination. And if they had something wrong with them, they would not be allowed into the United States. So supposing you had a bad leg, you would want to walk and carry your bag in front of your bad leg and to pretend that it was the weight of the bag that was causing you to limp. From the baggage room, the immigrants climbed a very steep and narrow staircase, and they didn't realize it, but as they were climbing, their medical examination had begun. There were two doctors standing at the top of the stairs with a piece of chalk, and as the immigrants climbed the stairs, the doctors were watching to see who had a limp. And if you were lame, you got an L on your lapel. If you were huffing and puffing, you might have a heart condition, you'd get an H. problems, conjunctivitis, goiter, hernia, pregnant, scalp infection, senility, suspected mental defect. The most dreaded examination of all was a doctor referred to as the eye man and he was looking for a disease called trachoma. It was extremely contagious, it would lead to blindness, and if you caught it, you would not be allowed into the United States. And the inspector would stand there with a basin of antiseptic and an old-fashioned button hook. And he would take the button hook, dip it in the antiseptic, flip it into your eyelid, and flip your eyelid back. He was looking for any redness or inflammation, and that was a sign of trachoma. You'd get a TC on your lapel, and you would be put in quarantine until they found out what was wrong with you. My father received a chalk mark on his lapel, and not realizing what it meant, he didn't wipe it off like others did. It seems that while uh, on ship, he shaved with a straight razor and cut his face and had a little scar. And so he was taken from the line for investigation. And my mother was frantic, begging and pleading, and even offered her marriage ban they should let him stay in the line. But they took him out. The main hall was designed like cattle stockyards to maximize the movement of human cargo. 
he had two minutes to ask a series of 29 questions. What's your name? Where did you come from? Why did you come here? How much money do you have? Where did you get it? Let me see it. Who paid for your passage? Do you have any friends here? Any relatives? Very often, I think of the enormity of the decision by the authorities. Had they decided to send me back, I probably would have been a bar of soap. Many European Jews denied admission eventually wound up on death lists back home. Many rejected Asians were sent back to hardship and persecution. There were a group, uh, an entire uh, shipload of Italians coming through that w did not have their papers. And their papers, th their official papers, were ultimately initial W period, O period, P period, without papers. So the workers at Ellis Island, just for shorthand, would say, oh, we have three WAPs here and there are five WAPs over there. If a person was a Christian, they would put a little crucifix on the top of the page. And if they were Jewish, they would put a circle. Well, the word for that is keikel. The new world was full of surprises. The first was food. The original food concessionaire stole most of the money he was given to feed the immigrants with, and he wound up serving them stewed prunes over dark bread twice a day. He was fired, and as time went on, with fewer immigrants coming, they were able to serve ethnic meals. They would have a German meal at 1 o'clock, an Italian meal at 2 o'clock, and so on. But that led to the problem of the German showing up at the Italian meal of spaghetti and tomato sauce, and a lot of them would refuse to eat it, saying it was just too frightening looking. We stayed for 10 days in the big hall. And there were double and, and triple bunk beds in there, very, very closed. And they were very, very crowded, and very, very smelly, and very, very noisy. It was constant turmoil. And each morning, I would take the two mattresses to the heap, and each night I would bring them back to put on the bed. And I only learned recently that the purpose of the mattresses being taken away was to fumigate them. The massive steam pressure tanks used to delouse mattresses are still in storage at Ellis Island, grim artifacts of a time when immigrants were considered as so many diseased rodents, ready to invade polite American society. New immigrants often reminded established immigrants of a dismal past they longed to forget. These new arrivals were a threat to the status quo and an embarrassment to be hidden away in overcrowded ghettos. Here, people would accept any job at any pay to make their American dream come true. But as the nation grew, the Ellis Island immigrants assimilated into communities coast to coast. Their legacy is the solid infrastructure of the country upon which rests the 20th century. Today, Ellis Island still celebrates the contributions of those people whose American dream began there with a museum and a program which keep their stories well, alive. it was quite a day. Here, For immigrants me, return to the record their memories, I met my offering the future family. a unique a look at the past. Feeling, and I choke up now as I remember it. As twin national monuments, the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island represent two points on the path to the American dream. Where we've come from and where we're going to. And the real spirit of liberty lies in the delicate balance between these two glorious notions. By 1900, the sea, air, and elements had changed Liberty's complexion from bright copper orange to pale green, a fitting way to begin the 20th century, which was itself defined by change. The new century was a kaleidoscope of images and ideas, and in the chaotic American culture, the Statue of Liberty became a fashion favorite. Its image appeared on all manner of trinkets. Even today, early renderings are highly prized. 
it's very strange as I collect different statues and, and you see the, the faces and the different images and the quality uh, you wonder what what the craftsman had in mind. One of my favorites of the collection uh, is probably this one here. And this is, uh, it's just so fun that they painted it all up. But inside it, it said, made in occupied Japan. Perhaps we cherish liberty because we realize that she is vulnerable. As in 1916, when German saboteur is at the height of World War I, managed to blow up a munition storage facility in New Jersey. First reports claim dozens of deaths. The impact was felt 90 miles away. Police were called to stop looting in the streets of New York, and the statue lost nearly 100 bolts in her right arm as a result of the blast. Still, her torch was held high, and when workmen surveyed the damage, they wondered if something more than copper and iron was keeping the statue standing tall and proud. It was the hope of those who gave us this statue and the hope of the American people in receiving it that the goddess of liberty and the goddess of peace were the same. During the Depression, Liberty carried a double load, holding both her torch and the nation's morale aloft. But a few short years later, her light would be dimmed by a second world war. This one more bloody than the first, as madmen threatened the future of mankind and liberty held her breath. Like so many others, she did her part. Her image reminded the American people of what was at stake around the world. When victory was finally declared, she joined the exuberant celebrations as a guest of honor in New York's Times Square. Ironically, the buoyant spirit at the end of war disguised the fact that liberty as well as the statue were fragile. Freedom demands constant vigilance, and liberty denied is often the catalyst for social eruption. In the second half of the 20th century, many groups who felt alienated from America's mainstream commandeered the statue to make their desperate political statements. 1956, Hungarian patriots occupy the torch and display their flag of liberation. 1965, a black liberation organization is caught plotting to blow up the statue. 1980, two protesters demanding freedom for an imprisoned Black Panther leader damage the statue as they climb the Liberty's exterior plates. These events, plus the corroding influence of acid rain, took their toll on the statue, showing just how fragile she actually was. Like Ellis Island, the Statue of Liberty was quickly becoming a neglected relic from America's past. Pieces of her ornate torch were breaking off and washing ashore in New Jersey. So it was with a great burst of patriotic zeal that America took a second look at both the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island. It started when uh, President Reagan asked Lee Iacocca to mount a private sector effort uh, to restore both the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island. First time I came here was a cold November day in 1982 with uh, Mr. Iacocca and the place was a wreck. Uh, I, I wondered what we'd gotten ourselves into. We felt that the American people would help us if we could figure out how to ask them to help us. The years have been hard on Ellis Island, and they've been hard on the lady with the torch across the harbor, too. Are we going to preserve these monuments, or will they become just ruins of the past, like the pyramids or the Colosseum? Are the values these monuments symbolize still alive in America, or are they part of our past? The one guideline was that no money would come from the government, and we fulfilled that. We've raised about $420 million. There's no way of actually knowing how many people have given to us, but we estimate about 20 million. School children alone gave us $6 million. The engineering challenges to fix the statue were enormous, and it was a race against the clock to have her ready for the 100th anniversary. Uh, the winter that we put up the exterior scaffolding on the statue, uh, it was a very, very cold winter, a lot of winds, uh, very cold. And uh, these uh, uh, workers they had a race on to see who could get the right bars in place so that who could be the first to give her a kiss on the lips. Inside the statue, the metal had originally been covered with coats of coal tar and paint, all of which had to be removed. 
We had removed the original paint on the inside of the uh, statue using liquid nitrogen. It had around seven layers of paint and it would just crackle and come apart. We thought we were going to spend months doing this and we wound up doing it in about a week and a half. Uh, but the coal tar was an entirely different situation. We couldn't get that out. The black sludge couldn't be sandblasted off by conventional means. That the skin only being a penny thick, why well, was uh, we couldn't we couldn't afford to have any copper loss. So we had to find something that was strong enough to take out the coal tar, but not hurt the copper. We finally found something very very sophisticated: bicarbonate of soda. More than 40 tons of bicarbonate of soda were used. Meanwhile, rusted armatures were swelling against the thin copper skin. And so it started ripping itself apart, and the weakest link was the copper. And indeed, uh, a number of the connections were, were completely destroyed uh, through this period of, uh, of rusting. Uh, this, this bar represents one of the first handmade samples of the armature bars that are part of the uh, tertiary structure that holds the copper in place on the statue. And of course, originally, it was very easy to make these because they had already used a, a process that is called repoussé. A literal translation is pushing from the reverse side in which they made the uh, copper, bent the copper on forms that were reverse forms. So then they just bent these bars on the same forms and, and the two matched very nicely. We, of course, had another challenge. We didn't have the forms, but we had to replace over 1,800 bars, no two of which were the same. It was exhausting, hand-wrought, repoussé work, which 100 years after the original construction was becoming a lost art. During the two world wars, in 1914 to 1918 and in 1945, we lost many skilled people trained in this technique. So today it's a technique, like a lot of the arts, which has lacked the craftsmen due to war casualties. French artisans were the only workers in the world who still performed repoussé, and their numbers were dwindling. Yet when they came to America to help in the restoration, they weren't welcomed with open arms. There was a conflict as soon as we arrived. In France, when we do sculpture, we can work freely with, for example, with wood, with plaster, with steel, without necessarily a trade union or guild. In your country, there were unions who didn't understand why parts of wood or plaster had to be made for them by others. Fortunately, it was a conflict that was short-lived. We had the Americans uh, uh, join the French and come over. And when they came over here, they taught our American uh, metal workers how to do this repose work. So uh, basically, the respect that they had for one another and the respect that the Americans had for the French technique wound up being uh, what, what made them all workable. They became very close friends in most cases. Today, ten years later, we take Americans into our studios who come to study for about two to three weeks, to whom we explain the repoussé process. Reclaiming the original look and attitude of the statue was a primary goal of the restoration process, particularly when the work focused on liberty's flame. Bartholdi's original design was for the flame to be a solid object covered in gold, and reflecting exterior light. But through the years, crude attempts were made to carve out panels and allow light to stream from the inside through colored glass. Gutsum Borglum, the man who carved Mount Rushmore, had made the greatest design change and the greatest error. His awkward recrafting of the flame kept the statue from being watertight. Yeah, that was the source of a lot of the water, with the salt air in the water uh, running down on the inside of the copper and coming in contact with the iron uh, armature that was the original structure within the statue. Today's new flame is Bartholdi's old idea, a solid gilded crescendo, simple and pure, Liberty is again enlightening the world. On July 4th, 1986, the party began. It was called Liberty Weekend, and it was shared with a billion and a half people around the world. We are the keepers of the flame of liberty. 
I ask that you all join me in this symbolic act of faith, this lighting of Miss Liberty's torch. As the celebration exploded across the night sky, it sparked a new spirit of awe and wonder at the meaning of liberty. One hundred years ago, when the world dreamt of freedom, the image of a lady with a torch came to mind. Today, when people long for liberty, the very same image captures their imagination. Beijing, China. Students demonstrate for democracy, sculpting a statue to symbolize their hopes and dreams. Here, the spirit of liberty still resonates. Standing up against tyranny, these students reminded us that all are created equal. Half a world away, the national effort to restore Ellis Island and the Statue of Liberty reflects the very same ideal, blending a celebration of the great American melting pot with the bittersweet recollection of our immigrant past. The statue has always been the symbol of, the, of, of America, and Ellis Island has always been the story of America. So you see, both of them are important in different ways. Any American that comes down and sees Ellis Island or Statue of Liberty should walk tall and they should walk proud. It's a great thing that they accomplished. It is rare and inspiring that so much energy and time and money has been committed by so many common individuals to create a monument that doesn't commemorate a great battle or a popular leader. Instead, the Statue of Liberty celebrates an idea, that elusive goal of universal freedom, which has never been totally achieved. This is the vision to which America runs, sometimes stumbling and sometimes carrying other nations along with it. Liberty is not carved in the marble hallways of the past, it is our dream of the future. America laughs and cries and loves and bleeds in the quest for freedom. Here at the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island, that idea takes a solid form. But always behind these symbols remains the quest. Freedom yet to be attained. Liberty preserved. How beautiful for patriot dreams that sees beyond the years thine alabaster city's gleam undimmed by human tears As fast as they can make them, we can eat them. Try 600 of them every second. They go by many names. Frankfurters, Franks, Red Hots, Dachshunds, Weenies. But it's still a bit of a mystery as to where we got the name Hot Dogs. Mm -mm -mm. American Eats, Thursdays at 10 on the History Channel.